check this out. Epic, complex graphics, plenty of smoke, plenty of explosions, high definition shadows, and a ton of anti-aliasing mixed in. Many youngins take these visual creations for granted, and I don't blame them, it's all they've ever known for the most part. But I want to step back, way back. I'm only 21, so I fit into this category as well. The quote, worst computer generated graphics I can remember were from my uncle's old Nintendo 64. So yeah, not that far back. Now at the time, the games looked great, cutting edge and snappy, I didn't think that they were terrible, but of course in comparison, they aren't even in the same realm. I want to step back much further than that to the time of cathode ray tubes. There's an off chance you still may be using one. They aren't extinct, but they've been phased out by LCD and OLED technologies. Color CRTs use electron firing guns with different phosphors to display images against a lead glass screen. Remember, high energy waves emitted from electron clouds are not good for you. We call them X-rays. These are technically analog displays, which are based on voltages that change over time. Digital displays utilize intermittent pulses of data instead, which is why they can transmit more data per second typically. Most electronics are now digital, many would argue that analog graphics don't really fall under the same category, but nonetheless, it's where it all started, and that's what we'll discuss first. And what better way to start than with a game like Space War? It has its roots in a little college you may have heard of, MIT. Only the most prestigious schools had access to top-of-the-line tech, and in 1962, this was it. It was written for the PDP-1, which utilized 2,700 transistors, compared to over 1 billion transistors found in modern Intel Skylake processors. We've come a long way. The game utilized a color cathode ray tube, and quickly paved the way for arcade games like Asteroid. The game's circular screen was predominantly neutral, and featured unique physics charts mimicking those that you would expect in real life. You can actually play a Java rendered version of this game via the link in this video's description. It has a bit of a learning curve, but it's very cool to step back in time like this, and to think that this was once cutting edge. Computer graphics also bled into virtual reality in the same decade. Yes, computer generated VR was invented in 1966. Ivan Sutherland built the first computer-controlled HMD, the head-mounted device, which used two independent screens to display wireframe images. The technology was revamped by NASA in the 1980s, but Sutherland became a graphics pioneer soon after its creation. He moved to the University of Utah and trained folks like John Warnock, who later invented Adobe Systems. I'm sure you've heard of that. I know I have. Photoshop, After Effects, and programs of that sort. You get the point. Remember, computer graphics doesn't just involve moving images, so pictures like this one were being sculpted more more and more by computers than by hand. In 1972, Pong was created by Alan Alcorn, an employee of Atari, as a quote-unquote training exercise. It was basic at first, but thanks to advancements in both memory and compute power, Alcorn was able to add additional features over time, increasing the level of difficulty and overall interest as a result. It was popularized in its arcade cabinet style and later emulated on more complex machines. By 1980, computers were bleeding into homes and offices as consumer and commercial products rather than leased experimentation machines. Dire Straits' Money for Nothing music video was one of the first 100% three-dimensional computer-generated productions ever undertaken, and it was a definite hit for MTV. It was definitely primitive, no one is arguing that, but it was a landmark nonetheless and the signal of another great beginning. In the film industry, movies comparable to the Star Wars trilogy revealed breathtaking graphics for the time. In fact, the very first Star Wars released, later renamed Episode 4, A New Hope, consisted of complex space travels, lightsaber battles, and animated machines, although many of these instances were admittedly still produced with figurines. Pixar released one of the first shader programs in 1988, a big step for CGI, and was later used to create fully computer-generated movies. Toy Story in 1995, it's a jump ahead, but bear with me, became the first full-length, fully computer-animated film under the Pixar Animation Studios name. In terms of arcade and computer gaming, I can personally recall games like Paperboy and Pokemon grabbing my attention, even well into the 2000s actually. Marble Madness, Tetris, classic arcade games that have been remade and revamped time and time again thanks to their basic yet addicting styles. Metal Gear, anyone? Created in 1987 and ported to the NES, albeit with heavy mods, this one gave users an unfamiliar take on third-person gameplay. Graphics weren't phenomenal, but it gave the impression of true depth, as did later games like Doom. Resolution at this point wasn't the priority, it was arguably depth. The strive for a true three-dimensional gaming experience that would be both captivating and immersive. We finally got it with a game called Quake, real-time 3D with eventual support for OpenGL 3D rendering, adding to the smooth gameplay. 
and boom, just like that, first person shooters, role playing games, even car racing games, all became just more interesting. Anything that wasn't 3D was suddenly considered old. It's a trademark of technology in general. There's always something better, and after Quake, developers could not keep up, regardless of the platform or target audience. Consoles like the Sony PlayStation, which I deconstructed right here, began releasing titles that were based on older franchises. Metal Gear is an example. I mean, look at the difference there. A personal favorite of mine, Crash Bandicoot, became a huge hit as well. I, I had to mention it, sorry. For movies at this point, computer-generated graphical interfaces were staples. Just look at Terminator 2. I mean, the concept behind a liquid metal machine would not be possible without CGI, period. How about Independence Day? All those alien spacecraft battles? CGI and green screens, of course, all controlled and rendered by computers with dedicated graphics cards and fully compliant 3D compute software. I know I'm jumping around quite a bit, there's a lot of information to consume, but you get my point. Things exploded at around the same time that 3D rendering became technologically possible. We had games like Diablo and Max Payne and The Sims all work into the computer consumer industry, full-length CGI films like Final Fantasy The Spirits Within captivate audiences with breathtaking and surprisingly realistic textures and shadows for 2001. I remember when this movie was released, it was it was crazy. And open world concepts like Grand Theft Auto Vice City rack in millions on the first modern consoles. I want to end the video like this. Here is the first Grand Theft Auto ever released. I still remember this game as a kid, and here's a clip of Grand Theft Auto 5 at max settings and in a much higher resolution. We've come a long way in just 20 years, and we've come much further in the past 40. In 20 more, channels like my own will have this GTA on the left and a much newer and more realistic game on the right. What do you imagine it'd look like? If it's anywhere close to the difference between GTA and GTA 5, I, I, I don't know. I can't picture it just yet, but it'll be here before we know it. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up if you thought it was cool. Give it a thumbs down if you do feel the complete opposite, or if you hate everything about life. Be sure to click the subscribe button if you haven't already, and stay tuned for more interesting videos like this, and check out some of the other history videos that I have in the history playlist. This is Science Studio. Thanks for learning with us.